Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Church Online Community Service. It is so great for you guys to join us. It's a wonderful, beautiful Sunday morning. So nice. So yeah. gorgeous. So gorgeous. So I'm Kirsty, and I'm here with Andrew, and we're part of the City Centre community. It's just such a blessing to be with you guys this morning, yeah. and it's actually a blessing to be hosting with Andrew for yeah. the first time. This, this is my first time in online church. Yes, yeah, so, it's so exciting. So we're going to take some time right now mm -hmm. to pray some verses over, over you. And so where it says I, we're going to say we in the verses. Mm. So Kirsty, would you yes. like to start? So the first verse is Psalm 139, 14. And it says, we praise you because mm. we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes. Your works are wonderful. We know that full well. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. Mm. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Mm. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. And Ephesians 2.10 reads, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Mm. Mm. And the final one, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12. We are chosen, holy and mm. dearly loved. Amen, amen. Well, these are all such encouraging verses. Yeah. And as we go into a time of worship, I really want you guys just to meditate on these verses again and just really know who you are in Christ Jesus. Know that, you know, we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. So wherever you are, just lift your hands up towards heaven and mm. praise them. Over to you, worship team. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wow, thank you so much worship team. It's so amazing to be able to worship yeah. together, although we are in these different locations. Mm. Really blessed to have you guys worship um, and serve for us like that. Amazing. Now Kirsty, yes? what was last week? Oh, last week was one of the best days ever. It was Easter. Yes! He has risen. He has risen indeed. Awesome. So just so great as a community, just to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the fact that he died for the world, he took away yeah. our sins. And not oh. only that, but the new life that we have in Christ Jesus, the <sighs> resurrected life, the life that's superior to Satan and all the cohorts of hell. It's just an amazing time just to praise God and just give him all the glory. Yes. So, this week we're returning back to our series on This Is Our Church. And Andrew, is there any kind of key things that you learned from our series so far? Yeah. So last week, last time we were doing uh, This Is Our Church series, mm -hmm. we were looking at our church being a word and spirit church. Yes. So some of the key points yeah. that I took from that is that as a church, we trust the Bible. Yep that it is God's inspired word. Yep. And that's what our church is built on. And what we see in the Bible, Kirsty, mm -hmm. is God moving in people's lives yes. with power yes. through the Holy Spirit, mm. performing miracles, people wow. speaking in tongues, people mm. prophesying. So because we trust in the Bible, we mm -hmm. also trust in God, in Jesus and the Holy Spirit to be moving in our lives today. So we are a mm. word and spirit church. Amazing, amazing. That's so encouraging. It's great to know that our church is built on the foundation yes. of God's word. And when we put God first, everything else falls yeah. into place. Amen. So Pastor Pete now is going to be unpacking 
our aspirational values and this week he's going to be talking about the value of our community so over to you pastor pete well welcome to church online my name is pete pastor here at city on a hill church in edinburgh warm welcome to each and every one of you and uh, today we're going to be jumping into our series looking at we call it this is our church where we're looking at our values looking at our vision looking at our purpose who we are and where we're going and uh, my hope and prayer is as we do that today that it will inspire you fill your heart with faith and build you up and encourage you let's pray and ask that god will speak to us as we turn to the bible father thank you so much for each and every person connecting today thank you god for the plans and purposes you have for them my prayer today is lord you'd speak to us inspire our hearts fill our hearts with faith transform us change us impact as we pray we open our hearts to you and lord for anyone who doesn't yet know you i pray this will be a moment where they connect with you in the name of jesus amen you know when I, i'm 48 now but when i was in my teenage years i became a christian when i was 15 but in the years that followed me becoming a christian as in my late teens god gripped my heart with a passion and that passion happens to be one of our core values as a church and the passion is for his church and i'm going to unpack that in a lot more detail but over the years it's manifested in different ways and just to be clear when i'm saying i'm passionate about his church i'm not just passionate about my church i'm passionate about the church and one of the ways it's manifested over the years is in the last five years a group of us in edinburgh have been hosting pastors gathering to pray together in unity because we believe in his church the church not just our church <clears throat> and actually that's spread and now uh, we're gathering pastors all across scotland across our nation to pray for the church and uh, this thursday we had a, a brilliant prayer time with about 120 screens on zoom with pastors from all across scotland from the north to the south right down in the highlands all the way into the borders from the west coast to the east coast and i started off by sharing because I'm, I'm hearing amazing stories because as we're praying and unsurprisingly God's answering and churches were starting to see glimmers of hope of churches growing so I started off the prayer time we had together this Thursday with uh, some testimonies of what God has been doing in our nation he, here's some of the ones I reported I reported that Life Church in Edinburgh has grown by 50% in the last year I reported that King's Church in Aberdeen they've bought the beach ballroom and made it into their church auditorium and they're filling it on Sundays that's, that's a lot of people hundreds and hundreds of people Free Church, the Free Church, the denomination across our nation has been planting churches like nobody's business. Young people have been raised up, trained up and sent out and new churches are being established. Uh, Assemblies of God Church in Fraserburgh, they're just about to move into their new building. And at Christmas, they had 1,400 at their Christmas services. In Fraserburgh, incredible. Home Church uh, are, are, are seeing, this is in Kirkintilloch, are seeing consistent growth by people coming to faith in Jesus. Uh, Charlotte Chapel in Edinburgh here, they planted another church in Edinburgh in the Guile. They've grown by into several hundred people now. Harvest Church in Hamilton, I love it. They've gone from 80 to 120 in one year. King's Church, just up here, my good friends at King's Church, they, before lockdown, they were about 170 people. These days, they're three to 400 people on a Sunday. That's phenomenal growth. Hope Church in the Borders, they've gone from 120 to 170 in one year. In Galish Eels, this is like a small town in the Scottish Borders. And they're about to plant a new church into Newton St. Boswell's, another town in the Borders. We've got Glasgow Grace Church is planting a church. Lighthouse Church in Venice, which we planted from our church in Edinburgh, start, a year ago it was a small group. Today they have 40 people meeting on a Sunday morning. Uh, and up in Aberdeen. Just now, the churches in Unity are distributing 100,000 Gospel of John's around every household in Aberdeen. And, uh, and hey, City and Hill, we've grown. I mean, our phys physical services have grown <coughs> in attendance. And we're seeing baptisms and growth, and we're encouraged. So I shared these testimonies with the folks on the screen. And then I said to people on the Zoom, why don't you, if you've got a story from you, because I knew that God was doing something, and it wasn't just with the, some of the obvious churches but it was the less obvious churches. And it was not just a few, but it was the many. <laughs> it's like God's moving in our nation. So I asked people on the Zoom, why don't you put into chat what you've seen in your church? And people started writing these testimonies. And I want, I'm gonna read the script to you from the chat. 
and I want you to be inspired. And remind yourself before, before we listen to this, this is Scotland that we're talking about. This is a country where for the last couple of decades, every month, 10 churches have been closing in Scotland, every month. So the, the decline of the church in Scotland has been horrendous. So in that nation, listen to what God is doing among the church. This was in the chat function. Dean Norby from Fife said, an SU group has started up in Inverkeithing High School. David Robertson from Hamilton said, so thrilled with three baptisms this coming Sunday. Lloyd from Kirk Liston said, the marketplace church he planted has grown from zero to 16 in the last six months. Dan Hudson reported that three Chinese students have become believers in the last six months. Gordon Al Allen from Edinburgh Elam reported they've got three baptisms on Sunday. Crooksey from Southside Church Rehope in Glasgow went from, they said the church went from 80 to 120 in a year. Guy Prenbrook from uh, King's Church, he reported that uh, we baptised five people in one of King's Church's house groups this year. Alan McWilliam reported that they've planted nine new churches through the Forge Cairn network of churches in the last 12 months. Jim Smith, four people, young people getting baptised this Sunday. Simon Dennis, we're baptising two teenagers this Sunday. Praise God. Gordon Allen from Edinburgh Elam, we're opening our third location in the second half of this year. <laughs> yes. From Alistair Barton, Aaron Baptist Church has doubled in attendance in the past year. We've had to, they've had to move to a larger hall in Broderick and Aaron. Shirley Berry, new people coming every week. Jessica Randall from City and Hill. The, this is the city centre community. We grew from 50 to 80 in one year and we saw just under 20 baptisms with two more on Sunday. Paul and Yuzolda reported uh, at least five people have become Christians through Street Cafe very recently in Edinburgh. Dave Brackenridge, home church Kirk until outside of Glasgow, he reported, we've moved to two services in our main location to fit people in. Both services continue to grow. Sunday, we had more kids than ever and more visitors than ever. We're almost having weekly decisions for Jesus and we've planted a second campus. <laughs> wow. Neil Cameron, Peter Head, six baptized last Sunday. Craig Stocks and Dundee, we saw 30% increase in numbers last year, more baptisms coming up. From Lloyd in Kirkliston, two baptisms at Kirkliston Church coming up. David and Zoe Fraser in Airdrie, we have the youth asking to be trained in preaching. Stephen, Pre uh, Stephen Prem from Rehoboth Church in Glasgow. On Palm Sunday, five people came forward to take baptisms. Eight new people came to church. John Crabe, we baptised 11 youth in December in Firestarters. Alan McKinnon, Darnley Mill Church, planted recently in recent years, is now growing, especially among older folk coming to faith. Paul Rees, Charlotte Chapel, Edinburgh. We sent a man to revitalise Hoyk Baptist, seeing significant growth from a small church, needing a bigger building for all the new people who are coming along. John Farnworth, Liberty Church in Fife. We had, <coughs> we have to reorganize, we've had to reorganise our Sunday meeting space to allow more people in. David Hill, try praying bus adverts across all of Scotland. Every bus depot has our ads on their buses. Sam Friedman, Victory Hill Church here in Edinburgh. Five new members added recently. Jordan and Abbey in Sky Bible Church. 16 new kids at the new SU group in Portree High School. <coughs> Michael and Evelyn Banks from Holy Trinity Church here in West of Hills. We've grown over the last year by 40 new people in our church in the last, in fact, over the last six months. 34 people in our most recent Alpha course. Simon Dennis, our church plant in Aberdeen is growing healthily with many unchurched families and kids now coming. From Ian Reid, our small Baptist church in Dundee has seen six new people. From KCA office, 21 baptisms over the last three weeks. <laughs> oh, wow. A couple of elder, so a couple of early church plants have got off the starting line. Michael Rollo, Found Church in Grangemouth, new church plant from Found Church in Falkirk. The church, small church plant saw 10 decisions last year. Melvin and Livingston were seeing growth. Jacob from Life Church here in Edinburgh was seeing genuine spiritual appetite resulting in disciples of Jesus. Paul Graham, City in a Hill Church. Seven baptisms this Friday from Alistair and Barbara uh, from the Apostolic Church in Glasgow. We're having 12 baptisms on Sunday evening. In the evening, someone told me, I've just led someone to the Lord. Now the number's 14 and counting. From Kay Haggerty, 
SU group going into the primary school in South East Edinburgh today, Bible Alive for all the P7s. Paul, sorry, I helped plant Take Hold Church with a team. 13, 13 services later, we're seeing new people coming all the time and people coming to faith in our services. We've invited 800 people to the Eastern Palm Sunday services. Malcolm McPherson, a traveling evangelist, he says, as I travel the country, I'm observing an increase in the responses to the gospel in church services. More organizations and churches in the streets reaching out, praise God. Robin McLean, SU Scotland, 33 young people were saved at one SU weekend out of 100 people who were there. Bibles were taken away and brought to school groups a few days later, heavily underlined. Wow. Alistair Barton, Kirkliston Parish, 100 children and toddlers, uh, all the way through to teenagers, coming every Friday to our outreaches. Kenny Gillis, Livingston Elam, two baptisms this Sunday. Stevie and Mary Roy from Whitburn Pentecostal Church. New people come along every week. Church is full on Sunday. We're running out of room in our building. From David Barry in Pitlochery up in the Highlands. The Lord is adding to us in Pitlochery. Building is too small. The youth group has a quarter of the school in attendance each week. That's 45 to 50 kids. SU has 25 to 30 each week. Baptisms in the lock on Sunday, more in the later part of the year, once the water heats up. <laughs> Scottish problem. From Sherry and Jonathan in Nairn, uh, new people are coming as they, as they moved into, <coughs> moved to us uh, from positions of disillusionment elsewhere, from maybe some dying denominations. David Meredith, Cornerstone Church, just over here in the Free Church in Edinburgh. Uh, membership has grown from 65 to 95 in the last six months. And from Rufai Adesolo, uh, I, I love Pastor Rufai, he's out in uh, Craig and Tinney here in Edinburgh. We're planting another church in Gala Shields this Easter weekend. And there's been tremendous 65% increase in membership growth in our church. I just want to stop and say, thank you, God, for what you are doing in Scotland. And notice, there's no heroes. It's, well, Jesus is the hero. Jesus is building his church and he's working across the churches, the free church, the Baptist churches, the Pentecostal churches, the small churches, the big churches, and everywhere in the middle, God is at work in our nation. And I praise God for that. So what, here's why that lights fires in my heart, because it's my value. And this is, this is City and Hill, this is our value. We think big about his church and its mission. We believe in the church. We believe the church is God's plan and the, and the vehicle by which his kingdom advances on earth. We are committed to the church's success locally and globally. <clears throat> Let me now take you to the Bible, because what I saw when I was in my teenage years, I want to show to you today. And God showed it to me when I was in my teenage years. First time I remember reading Daniel chapter two for the very first time. It's like it was a jaw dropping moment for me because I suddenly realized something about this thing we call the church that I hadn't realized before. And it totally changed my mind, filled my heart with a vision and has these verses to this day compel me probably more than any other verses when it comes to the success and growth of the church on planet earth. So let me give you some context. This is 600 years before Christ. Babylon has invaded the land of, it, of Israel. Judah and the people of God have been taken into captivity in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian ruler, is the, is the world's superpower leader at the time. He's the most mentioned pagan king in the Old Testament. And Daniel, who's writing the book of Daniel, uh, was uh, an exile, a slave, a Jewish slave, and he was writing from that place of his back being against the wall. And he's now writing to, uh, write, writing to us, and it's in Daniel chapter 2. And this is the thing about Daniel, he influenced through the reign of five kings. And he brought two of the heathen kings to faith in the living God. And he made the worship of the true God law in a land where he was influenced as a slave and as a foreigner. Wow. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. 
Tell the dream to your servants and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made into rubbish heaps. <clears throat> but if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honour. <laughs> what a predicament. So he really knew how to motivate his staff. Right? It's just like, wow. So there, the, in this situation, and what was going on here was this. The king had seen something so significant in his dreams that he wasn't willing to risk some kind of pseudo-spiritual, slightly plausible sounding interpretation. He wasn't willing to risk that. He knew that they could spraff. He, he knew that if, if, if he gave them the dream, they could come up with some sort of, okay, we think it means this. And he might not be sure that they got it right, but he wanted to be sure they got it right. So he said, okay, I want to know that you've got the power to interpret the dream by telling me what the dream was in the first place, <laughs> like raising the bar ever so slightly. So the people started panicking and then the king said, okay, enough's enough. I'm going to put you all to death. And the command went out from the king to have the wise men and the Chaldeans and the, the conjurers put to death. However, Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, were believers in God, in the true God. And they were part of this group called the wise men. They were, they were part of this grouping that were the king's advisors. And they heard about this king's command. And they asked the king's commander, please give us one day. And they prayed. And that same night, God gave Daniel the same dream. And so then the next morning, the, 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 uh, into the king's presence, Daniel is rushed into the king's presence and he stands before the king and he starts to declare to the king his dream. And this is what it says in verse 28. There is a God in heaven, Daniel says to the king, who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. Now let's just stop there for a moment. What will take place in when? Well, the latter days. So Daniel's telling the king, I'm about to tell you a dream, king. I'm going to describe to you the dream that you saw, and I'm going to tell you what it means. But you need to understand that God has shown you what will take place in a period of time. And that period of time is called the latter days or the last days. And this period of time, as we know as New Testament believers, refers to the era that we currently live in. It's the time between Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming. We're living in the latter days. So this dream is about the time we're living in. That's so important. He goes on and says, this was your dream and the visions you had in your minds while you were on your bed. Verse 31. You, O king, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue was large and of extraordinary splendor. It was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome. The head of the statue was made of fine gold, its breast and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, <clears throat> its legs of iron, his feet partly of iron, partly of clay. And you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue in the feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed. All at the same time it became like chaff on the summer's threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You can say that bit with me. The stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So what's the dream about? Well, let me give you the kind of historical interpretation of the dream first of all, and then let me tell you how it applies to our generation. <clears throat> first of all, the historical interpretation. There was four parts to this statue represented by the four different types of metal. And these four parts of the statue represented, Daniel told the king, four different world empires, because he goes on to interpret the dream to the, to the king. And he says, the statue represents four world empires that will come on the earth. He said, you are the first world empire. You're the Babylonian empire. You are the head of gold. And then the, the next part is the, is the silver, and that represents the empire that will come after you. Now, they didn't know what the empire was that was coming after them. But in history, we know, we can look at our history books and we know, okay, that was the Medes and the Persians. They defeated the Babylonians. That's the shoulders of silver. Then there's the middle and thighs of bronze. Then that represents the Greek empire. Remember Alexander the Great? They defeated the Medes and the Persians who had defeated the Babylonians. And then there's the legs of iron. 
and that represents the Roman Empire, who defeated the Greek Empire, who defeated the Medes and the Persians, who defeated the Babylonians. So there we have history. Daniel saw it before it ever happens, and he predicted it would happen. But notice, I just want to, this is a sub point, but I just want to give the credibility to the scripture here. Look at the, the layers of depth in the prophecy. Notice, first of all, that the value of the metal, gold, silver, bronze, iron, becomes less valuable as you go down through the kingdoms, successive kingdoms. And so too, historically was the case that these kingdoms eroded in their moral values as you went down from the Babylonians to the Medes and the Persians to the Greek Empire to the Romans, who were um, very, very morally corrupt. So it became less and less values. And then secondly, notice the metals become harder. Gold's a soft metal, silver's a bit harder, bronze is even harder, but iron, well, it's iron. And so also each kingdom lasted successively longer periods of time. They were more durable. So the Babylonian Empire lasted 86 years. The Medes and the Persians lasted 208 years. The Greek Empire lasted 268 years. And the Roman Empire in one of its forms lasted 539 years. So each kingdom lasted progressively longer. Isn't that incredible? But then it says, and this, this, is, this is the bit I want to focus in on. It says in verse 35, the stone that struck the statue, it became a great mountain and fills the whole earth. <clears throat> so here's the question, who's the stone or what's the stone? And the answer is, the stone is a man and the stone is the movement he began. So the man, 2000 years ago, about 2,000 miles away, a child was born, so insignificant, so small, like a little stone, so small compared to the statue of world empires. He was born at the time of the Roman Empire, the, the legs of iron. And this stone struck the legs of iron, born to a virgin. His mother, Mary, was a teenager, probably 13 to 17 years old. His father, Joseph, was a working class man, a carpenter. He received no formal education. He never went to school, never went to college, never got any degrees. And yet this is the most famous person who's ever lived. And his qualifications, even though they weren't there, he never wrote a book, never wrote any articles, never wrote any songs. And yet more books have been written about him, more songs sung about him. More, in the Bible, his, his biography is the world's all-time bestseller. His life lasted a brief 33 years. And in just three years of ministry, he impacted the world more than any other person has impacted, even given their entire lifespan. His, wor his words are held in highest regard. The Bible, as I said, is the world's all-time bestseller, and it has inspired the birthing of aid organizations, legal systems, abolition of slavery, healthcare systems, care for orphans and widows and elderly globally, and education systems, all birthed from the teachings of this man. Jesus Christ. His first coming alone fulfilled over 300 prophecies and all human history dates to his birthday. BC before Christ, AD, Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. And today, one in seven people on earth are authentic followers of Jesus. Wow. And his death was no accident. He died intentionally, by choice, as the sinless one on behalf of us sinners. He died in your place, he died in my place. And when we look at the cross, we realize two things. First of all, wow, our, our sin is so serious. Look at the cross. It took the death of the Son of God to take away my sin. And then when I look at the cross, I also realize, secondly, I am so loved. Wow, he would love me that much. He was willing to do that for me. So I am so sinful, but I am so loved. And you are so sinful, and you are so loved. And Jesus died to save your soul. And then on the third day, he rose again. Remember the Bible says the stone was cut out of the mountain without human hands. There we see the virgin birth. This was God intervening in earth. This wasn't humans doing. And the resurrection, this was God intervening in earth. The life of Jesus was bracketed by two impossibilities, the virgin's womb and the empty tomb. He entered the world through a door marked no entrance and he exited the world through a door marked no exit. Jesus Christ, son of God, living forever, Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is that man. And his name and his fame is spreading more than ever before. 
that stone that struck the statue truly is becoming a great mountain and filling the whole earth. But it wasn't just Jesus, it was the movement he began. His church, the kingdom. Isn't that incredible? His church, his people are spreading on this earth more than any other group or people are. And they are the vehicle through which his kingdom comes. So the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So when will that happen? Well, it said in the verses. It says that Daniel stood before Nebuchadnezzar and says, God has shown you, Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the latter days. So when is the stone that struck the statue becoming a great mountain and filling the whole earth? When? Well, the time we're living in. The, the destiny of the church is to fill the whole earth. <laughs> you think, wow! And I remember reading that as a teenager because I was aware as a teenager that churches were declining. I was aware as a teenager that churches were dwindling. I kind of the, the population viewed the church as a little bit irrelevant. And here's me reading that in the last days, in other words, before Jesus returns, the church is going to become like a mountain on the earth, filling the whole earth. And I don't believe everyone's going to be saved, but you can't miss it. Like a mountain on everyone's horizon, you won't be able to miss the church. Some people will love it, some will hate it, but you won't be able to miss it, the church of Jesus Christ. And actually, this isn't the only place in Scripture where this sort of thing is alluded to. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, Isaiah predicts about the church, it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the nations will stream to it. And then again in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 to 23, talking about Jesus, it says, God placed all things under his, Jesus' feet and appointed him, Jesus, as the head over everything for the church, which is his body. What's going to happen to the church? It's the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. How is God going to fill everything in every way? Answer, through the church. And there's nothing that will transform society more than a life, God-glorifying, spirit-filled, Bible-based, people-loving, poor-helping, disciple-making, gospel, gospel-preaching local churches. Nothing will change the world more than that. And so I love the local church. We love his church. We believe in its mission. We think big about its mission. We believe in his church. We believe in what God is doing in his church. And the church has been growing like wildfire. On the day of Pentecost, just after the resurrection, 120 people gathered in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. And the next thing that happened was this, that 3,000 people were added to the church. The church continued to grow rapidly till the point where by the fourth century, over 50% of the Roman Empire were followers of Jesus. Incredible. That's despite persecution, despite threat, despite martyrdoms. The church just grew rapidly. Nothing could stop it. In the fifth century, Patrick heads to Ireland. And in 30 years in Ireland, he had established over 700 churches, trained 3,000 leaders and brought an end to slavery. Praise God. In the 18th century, the Moravians started the first large-scale Protestant missionary movement. And the Moravians sent out, in 30 years, they sent out hundreds of people to plant churches around the world, in all different places, from the Antarctic to the Caribbean. There was even two Moravians who heard of some African slaves who were being held by a slave owner in the Caribbean who had vowed that no missionary would get near them. And the only way they could reach these African slaves was they themselves sold themselves into slavery and became slaves alongside the slaves in order to win the slaves. Incredible. And then we see the John and Charles Wesley in the 18th century. I mean, they, they brought transformation in, in, in the UK and beyond. In fact, secular historians say it's because of the influence of John and Charles Wesley and the other reformers of the time that Britain was diverted from what happened in France, the French Revolution. So many people came to faith. William Carey in the 18th century went to India. He founded the Baptist Missionary Society. He planted hundreds of churches, translated the Bible into six languages, built hundreds of schools for all castes, set up medical clinics for the poor. He printed Asia's first newspaper and built the first college in Asia. And he stopped the hideous practice of widow burning. William Carey. In the 20th century, we've seen the greatest growth and more martyrdoms than any other of the previous centuries. The 20th century began with 1904, the Welsh Revival, and in two years, 100,000 people in Wales 
came to faith in Jesus. 1906 was the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles, where William Seymour led a revival. That this humble man saw thousands upon thousands of people experiencing the power of God and miracles. It birthed the Pentecostal movement, where today, one in 10 people on earth, this is just, a, just over 100 years later, one in 10 people on earth are part of Pentecostal charismatic churches. Last century, Seoul, in, sorry, in South Korea, they went from 0% Christian to 40 to 50% Christian in one century. In Africa, Africa, at the beginning of last century, they were 9% Christians in Africa. By the end of last century, there was 50% Christians in Africa. The Chinese underground church in recent years has been growing at a rate of 25,000 new believers every day. As we turn into the 21st century, church leaders gathered in Jordan for a conference. Leaders from all across the Muslim territories and they reported unanimously that between 80 and 90% of Muslim converts to Christianity have personally had visions of Jesus. This is a move of God. And today, according to Barrett and Johnson, 100,000 people become Christians every day. So today is a good day. And every week on earth, 4,500 new churches are established. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The stone that struck the statue is becoming a great mountain and filling the whole earth. Now, let me put it this way. If, if you were a gambler 2,000 years ago and you were to put your, place your bets, your options were, okay, the Roman Empire with their Caesars and their, uh, their infrastructure and their architecture and their legions of soldiers and all their resources, or a guy with long hair, flip-flops and a motley crew of followers, just a handful of them, fishermen, most of them. I mean, who are you going to place your bets on? Which one will last the next two millennia? <laughs> and here we are 2,000 years later and we're calling our kids... Peter, Paul and Mary, and we're calling our dogs Nero and Caesar. <laughs> so thank God Jesus won. Praise the Lord. The stone that struck the statue has become a great mountain is filling the whole earth. So just in closing, let me just give us three things to reflect on. Number one, change your view of church. Have a big vision of his church and his kingdom. Today, do you know, it's pretty sad. In, in our Western world, people treat churches like restaurants or shops. They're like consumers. Uh, if you don't get good service here, you go to the next one. You go to the next popular show in town. And actually, that cheapens and weakens people's spirituality. So stop dating churches. It's time to commit to one. Some people say, ah, oh, but the church has hurt me. It's full of hypocrites. And do you know what? I agree. And I love that actually God loves this group of hypocrites. And uh, the truth is, all humans are hypocrites. All humans are living lives that they shouldn't be living. But thank God the church is where people can accept their hypocrisy and embrace the fact that, you know what? God loves hypocrites like us. So where else can you go, to be honest? If you want to escape hypocrites, where else can you go? You've got hypocrites in the pub, you've got hypocrites at the sports club, you've got hypocrites at the university. So sure, the church is full of hypocrites, but the world is full of hypocrites. So welcome to the world, join a church full of imperfect people. <coughs> in fact, imperfect people only welcome. Do you know, don't quit on the church. Don't quit on what Jesus doesn't quit on. Don't condemn what Jesus died to raise up. Don't put down what Jesus said he would build. Don't reject what Jesus said he would never reject. Jesus calls the church his bride and he will never reject his bride. In fact, he, Paul the apostle, when he had this first encounter with Jesus, in that moment, he suddenly realized how Jesus valued the church. The first words he heard from Jesus' mouth in Acts chapter 9 and verse 4 was, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, Saul was listening and he's thinking, wait a minute, I'm persecuting the church. And you're saying I'm persecuting you? Because the re reality is if you hurt the church, you hurt Jesus. Touch the church, you're touching Jesus. Handle with care. Don't bitch about churches. Don't put churches down. Don't gossip about churches. Don't hurt churches. Why? You hurt the church. You hurt Jesus. And then Jesus told that famous parable. At the end of time, he will gather people before him like a, like a shepherd gathers the sheep and the goats and separates them out. And in Matthew 25, verse 40, the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. He says, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you, you visited me. And he said, whatever you did to the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. You visited that brother. You visited Jesus. You helped that person in prison. You visited Jesus in prison. You helped that sick person. 
you did it for Jesus. Jesus takes the, so you help the church. You help Jesus, you bless the church. You bless Jesus. Whereas conversely, you hurt the church. You hurt Jesus. Jesus takes the church so personally, and I encourage you to take the church so personally. Some people say, all right, yeah, I'm a Christian. I just don't, I just don't really connect with church. Well, technically, technically you can be a Christian without the local church. But you can't live the Christian life without the local church. There are a ton of one another's you can't do by yourself. So be part of a local church. Our value is we think big about his church and its mission. We believe the church is God's plan and vehicle by which his kingdom advances on earth. We are committed to the church's success locally and globally. Notice we say we believe in his church, not just our church. That's what I started earlier by saying, uh, celebrating the success of churches all around our land. Do you know what? I'm into the church and I love sitting in a hill totally, but I sit in a hill, our value is the church. So their win is our win. When they do well, we rejoice. And I want to encourage you to foster that same mentality, have a united mentality with true believers. I'm not talking about ecumenicalism where, you know, all beliefs are embraced. No, I'm, I'm talking about true believers, people who hold to the authority of scripture. I'm talking about people who believe in the true gospel. Unity among those churches, their success is our success. And also we believe in the church's success locally and globally. And so we're thinking big about this mission. And so City and Hill, our, our dream is, we've got six current physical communities and church online as well. We're one church in seven communities. But I think our dream in the years to come, I think we wanna see multiple more communities emerge. I mean, lots, like to the point where the sick people will think, do you remember the day when we only had seven? <laughs> and they'll think, wow, yeah, I remember that. Look how many we've got now. I think God wants to plant these worshiping communities all around Edinburgh and the Lothians. And again, we're doing that in full awareness that we're doing it alongside other great churches. There are other churches that are doing the same, but together we can totally re-impact this population of Edinburgh and the Lothians and Fife. But also we think, I think we're gonna plant churches all over Scotland. We, we've already been the catalyst for sending people out, training them up, sending them out and establishing groups in various places. And I think in the days ahead, we're only gonna do that more and more, but not only in Scotland. Our vision is we want to plant churches in Belfast and in Brighton and over into Paris and over into Doha and down into South America and all across the Asia nations and African nations and European nations. I think God wants to do a great thing and God wants us to use us to be a catalyst to send people out and dream big. So I want to encourage you, commit to the church, serve in the church, give to the church financially. Give of your substance to the church. The church can't operate or exist without God's people being stirred for God's purposes. So please give generously. Bring your tithes and offerings to the church. Pray for the church. Let's pray because it's, it's, it's not just our zeal or our best hopes will make it happen. It's the work of God. Pray for the church. Point number two, think big, act small. Here we see God thinking big but acting small. When God wanted to change the world, he thought big, but he acted small. A baby was born, born to a virgin in a small town called Bethlehem, changed the world. Think big, act small. Think global, act local. Having a small church isn't a sin. Having a small vision is. We've got to carry big vision, even though sometimes what we're involved with is small. In 1998, just along the road here, me and Angie started the church in our living room. We were thinking big, but we acted small. And for the first year, we had about five people on average most weeks. And you think, wow, that's not very impressive. But we were thinking big and acting small. So think big, act small, think global, act local. And that's how God works. And do you know what? All of you, all of us are called to do one thing. We're called, Jesus said, go and make disciples. So make disciples, just one life at a time. Share your faith with someone. Help them to grow in Christ. Help them to connect with church. Just one life at a time. Think big, act small. And then finally, number three, be wholly dependent on God's Holy Spirit. Be completely dependent on the Spirit of God. 
The statue in, Daniel, in Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel's dream represented man-made empires. Man's pride, man's empires, man's hard work. But notice in the dream, there was a stone that was cut out of the mountain without human hands. And it struck the statue and the statue became like chaff and on someone's threshing floor. And, you know, where's the Roman Empire today? Where's the Greek Empire today? These have come and gone, but the stone that struck the statue is becoming a great mountain and it's filling the whole earth. So man-made empires don't last. Man-made doesn't last, but God-made does last. And I want us to be a church, I want us to be a people who are wholly dependent on God's spirit. A couple of Sundays ago, uh, in our Leith service, there was a precious old brother, Benson, comes to our church, came, turned, I hadn't, I hadn't actually seen him for a few months, came to church, had so much pain around his neck, he could hardly turn his head either way, so much pain. Prayed for him, God miraculously healed his neck completely healed, full movement restored, and, it sang, and he sang, he sang a song to celebrate. So I, I praise God, God is able. See, you and I, we, we can't change a life, we can't heal the sick, we can't deliver demon, people from demons, we can't raise the dead, we can't change our cities, but God can, and God can do it through us. And in the book of Acts, being wholly dependent on God's spirit looked like they were a people of prayer. So in Acts chapter one, 120 people prayed before Pentecost and then Pentecost came. Then in Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit had come and the church was birthed, the Bible says the believers devoted themselves to prayer. Acts chapter three, it was as Peter and John were on the way to pray that they met the lame man and God did the miracle. Acts chapter five, 5,000 men and women were in the church by this point. The church continued to grow. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and Peter, it was when they were praying that a revival came to the Gentile peoples. Continually, it's prayer, prayer, prayer. Being wholly dependent on God's Holy Spirit. Be people of prayer. Trust God that the stone that struck the statue is gonna become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. Let's pray for that in our generation. Zechariah chapter four, verse six, God says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Coming into land, at the end of this episode, Daniel's recounted to the king his dream. You imagine the king's face. I mean, this was a guy, wow. This Jewish exile has just described to me the dreams that were in my head. The king was so moved. And the Bible says this in Daniel 2, verse 46 and 47. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face. The king answered Daniel and said, surely your God is, the, is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries. It's interesting that Historically, archaeology has shown that Nebuchadnezzar's king had a title, and the title was the Great Mountain. That was the title, the translation of the title given to Nebuchadnezzar's king. It's God. And here God said, hey, your God's not the Great Mountain. What the true God's going to accomplish on earth will become a Great Mountain. And Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges, he understood that his God wasn't God but that God is God, and God is the God of gods, and the, the Lord of kings, he says. In other words, he was saying as a king, I am under this Lord. And actually, as you go through the book of Daniel, you discover in a few chapters, Nebuchadnezzar comes to faith in the true God. And hey, I just wanna say, will you do the same? Will you bow down and say, this God is the true God? I bow, I humble myself, and sure, you're not the king of Babylon, but you're a bit of a ruler in your own life and it's time to dethrone yourself and enthrone Jesus Christ and let him be Lord and King of your life. Well, let's pray. Thank you so much that you're doing something in my generation, God. Thank you, you're moving in power in Scotland. We've heard the stories, we hear the rumors and we see it's just the beginning of what you're going to do. But God, we thank you all over the world you're moving in power. And I pray, God, that uh, we would be part of your purpose. Thank you for the church. We believe in the church. We throw our weight behind the church. We love the church. Not just our church, we love the church. Help us to all our days be very much participants in the church of Jesus Christ. Why don't you make that decision yourself? Maybe you've, maybe you've been standing at a distance from church for too long. It's time to come close and be part of church. Maybe you've been hurt by church in the past and it's been a long time since you've been at church because of that. It's time to now, come on, reconnect. There is no perfect church, but there is a perfect saviour who is Lord of the church. And the truth is this, 
that we can only fulfill our potential as part of the local church. So make some decisions about the church. But let me also give you an opportunity, if you're joining today and you don't yet have a relationship with God, I described earlier how Jesus died in your place on the cross and rose again. And today you can make the greatest decision ever, the best decision, the decision that will define the rest of your life. And the decision is to accept Jesus as the risen Lord and Saviour, and he will totally transform your life. If that's you, I want to give you that opportunity to pray this prayer just now. So if that's you, pray this prayer with me one line at a time. Say, dear Lord God, I'm so grateful for your love for me. Jesus, thank you, you're alive, risen from the dead, King and Saviour. Be my King, be my Saviour today. Thank you, God, for your love for me. I embrace you. I put my trust in you. I'm now yours. Amen. And as you prayed that, I know God has heard your prayer. We'd love to hear from you if you made that decision today. Please let us know. God bless you. We value the church.
Thank you so much, worship team. And thank you, Pastor Pete, for such an impactful and encouraging message. So powerful, so powerful. So it's been great spending this time with you this morning. And it's been good to unpack who we are and who we hope to be as a church community. Yeah. It's so important to be walking this journey of faith mm. in community. So I would really encourage everyone, if you're not part of a small group, get involved. And um, it's such a blessing yeah, to be in that so community, good. be walking with brothers and sisters every day, every week, every month, every year, through the highs and the lows of life. Mm -hmm. And like Andrew said, it's so important to be in community and fellowship with one another. So please do not rush off. We have our virtual Zoom coffee after mm. this service so the zoom details are below so please please attend if you can mm -hmm. so that's the end of our service mm -hmm. i'm going to pray over us all yes. now so if you want to bow your head and open your hands in prayer mm. lord thank you for this message that pastor pete has brought lord please bless city on a hill mm. help us to be united Help us to be strong in fellowship, Lord. Help us to love one another as you love mm. us, Lord, as we would desire to be loved. Mm. Lord, please bring revival mm. <clears throat> to Edinburgh yes, and to Lord. Fife, Lord. Mm. You sit on a hill to bring light into the darkest places, mm. Lord. Help us to love our neighbor, love God, and love our church and make disciples, Lord. Mm. Bless all the leaders of City on a Hill. Bless every member of City on a Hill and bless Edinburgh, Lord. Mm. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your love. In the wonderful and beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Have amen. a blessed week, guys. Have a blessed week. Bye. 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 Take a moment um, and actually, can we restart? Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> He has risen. He has risen indeed. Amen. Amen. It was just so good just to celebrate, you know, the risen resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And just the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us as Christians. You know, he, Amen. what he's done. No, sorry. Stop that. What he's done for the world. Not for the Christians, for the world. He died for the world. Sorry. I'll do that again. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was